Welcome to our panel discussion. Before we begin, we're going to let um, another team member introduce the giveaway drawing for this session. I'll stop sharing and let him share. Hi, my name is Shopu. I'm from team 18227. To enter in the drawing at the end of this session, please rename yourself to your full name, then your team number in parentheses. If you're a rookie team and do not have a team number, then put your abbreviated team name in parentheses. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so everyone, welcome to our panel discussion. Today we have invited four FTC coaches as panelists and they will be discussing topics such as remote coaching, building, training, and tournaments in the new season, as well as answering some questions from the audience afterwards. And most of these coaches will be touching on a few points they also find important before the main discussion. Okay, so first we have Dr. Patrick Michaud from 7172, who you may remember uh, from last session. Uh, as you know, he is well known for coaching team 7172. And here we have a few pictures of them. They have been to Worlds multiple times. And next we have coach Jared Clark. Um, Jared Clark is the coach of Team 16602, I University Prep Owls, and he has coached FTC for one year. He teaches at I University Prep, which is a virtual school with students from all throughout the state, and they are the best, second best um, performing virtual school in the nation. Let me unmute. Oh, did we bring him in as a panelist? Yeah, he's here. Okay. Yeah, um, you can, Jared Clark, uh, Mr. Clark, you can start uh, talking about your, some of your discussion points. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, last year was our first year, and so we have a lot of parts that were still just a little bit like a rookie team in that we started a little late and uh, struggled through the year. But being that we had students all over the state of Texas, we got a lot of experience on working remotely. And so there's a couple items that I'd like to share regarding that. And that was uh, focusing on communication and then setting it up so that uh, the community, that everyone can be involved. Um, we worked through uh, uh, a little bit of a sharing system like this and we would use Google Forms so that way everybody could interact with the same form and just copy and paste all of our coding there. Uh, and it was important, we learned pretty quickly to copy all of it uh, to a separate form before you start messing with it too much in case you make any mistakes. You always have uh, an original that you know you could come back to. And that was something that we found worked very well with all aspects of anything that we needed to work online with. Um, and then another big part was to set uh, communication up. We use Google Chats. Um, I've heard of other schools and teams using Discord, um, but just something so that all the students can communicate. Um, a big thing we're gonna do differently this year is have chats for all of the uh, like topics. So we'll have a coding chat, we'll have a building chat, we'll have a design chat, and then that way, uh, students can take the lead on that and then focus just on their part of what they do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, next, we have uh, Parvel Gu from 18227. Um, he coaches the rookie team, FTC team 18227. Uh, he has been a volunteer coach in FIRST Robotics for three years, and he's led FLL team 40657 ACP Young for two years, and this will be his first year coaching an FTC team. In the past month, his team has done some rigorous training to transition well into FTC and is actually helping us host this workshop today. Uh, he will be discussing some things about growing from FLL to FTC. Oh yeah, it's part of here. So yeah, it, it's a unique experience to like just grow with the kids because uh, for FTC, we're totally a rookie team, but for FLL, we had fun experience before and we even got some achievements here. But now it feels like a totally new platform. So everything's different because the FIO, they, play, they still play with Lego stuff. And the FTC, they have to hand build a lot of manual gear stuff. Um, uh, not totally from scratch, but it's totally different from just putting Lego pieces together. So my experience from like a transition from FIO context to FTC is like, I still feel like 
there are some common cores in the engineering part because I was engineering coach on that side. So uh, I, I still feel there's going to be a common fundamental and core knowledge if the kids are getting well trained in FLO for this kind of common sense engineering. Uh, that's going to help them better adapting to the FTC environment and the competition well. For example, the CAP part and uh, mentored by the FTC uh, team, uh, 8565, we introduced CAP. I think we're the very, uh, a few, very few first teams who introduced CAP into the FL, even for the FL experience. We introduced them to use CAD to design the robot before they can actually build it. Uh, we also introduced uh, the control algorithms like the full set of PID and in, even in FL team, because uh, I got a feeling so in FL teams, there's a very few teams introduce a full set of PID. Some of them may be using some proportional part, but yeah, I feel this kind of engineering training they got in FL level um, it's going to help them to better adapt themselves into another level of competition. So that's my point. We can discuss more later in the panelists. Yep, that's my uh, I thoughts and ideas so far. Okay, thank you, Coach Gu. And finally, we have Coach Fang Wang from our team 8565. Um, she has been a first team coach for more than a decade and has coached a junior FLL for four years, FLL for seven years, and this will be her seventh uh, year coaching in FTC. Um, she and team A565 have established a first team ladder with ACP Robotics with team members ranging from kindergarten to 10th grade split among eight teams. And this summer she has been working with ACP to um, prepare for the new season with remote options. Okay. Um Hey, Alan, thank you. Uh, before I start talking points, I just want to uh, explain the drawing again. I think uh, uh, Shopo forgot to mention, we're going to draw uh, $50 store credits at gobuilder.com. Uh, to be eligible for drawings, you need to change, uh, add in your team number after your name. So he's going to take attendance there, take your team number, put in the, uh, the drawing wheel. So if you look at uh, the panel list, I guess you can see my name followed by 8565 and uh, Pavel and Patrick. Yeah, those are the way you're gonna put your team number after your name. But if you happen to be a rookie team number, uh, rookie team don't have a final number yet, you can put abbreviated now name there. The purpose of this is we're trying to minimize, uh, uh, we only gave, uh, um, we know which team you are from, so we make, make sure the giveaway is going to different teams, not going to one team. Yeah, but if you have multiple team members in the same session, you definitely get a more chance to, to win it. Okay, so I put down a, quite a few points here. Uh, I can go a little bit briefly here. So the first one is uh, to be the same as Jerry's mentioned, my team happened to choose Slack. Uh, we used to have emails, there's so much a bump into everybody. And we started Slack maybe last season or season before. Uh, it was very helpful. As he said, you can have all, so he mentioned about different chats. So we have different channel here. We have hardware, software, CAD, all, all of which. So every channel has specific topics. So you don't vary it, um, the, the, the topics here and there. Uh, with everyone remote, so this online engineering book, maybe many teams already have done this. So my team has done this since second year um, using the Google Docs. So everyone can see everyone's work instead of waiting until team meeting to discuss. So during the week, you know what's uh, the progress on different screen. Another one is special for this COVID-19 situation. So everyone, you can get a Zoom, free Zoom, that's a 40 minutes limit, but the Zoom is providing this education plan. Um, so if you are K-12 students, you can apply for that and they will remove that 40 minutes limit. So basically my team member, I asked everyone to get that Zoom set up. Uh, this summer, they have been uh, mentoring other younger kids. So they always have this Zoom ready to go um, for ad hoc discussion stuff without 40 minutes limit. Um, the next one is a CAD first, the build next. So that's everyone's dream to start with, but uh, like my team did, but we didn't reach that until probably last season. And as Coach Gu just mentioned for his team, his uh, a rookie team, it's actually a perfect time. Uh, they have to do CAD. Um, we actually kind of force them 
we don't distribute the parts until they finish their CAD model. This, uh, uh, this is a, it's a challenge time, but it's also an opportunity to get kids into this mode. And actually, it did pretty well. Um, so Coach Gu is going to distribute the models, um, uh, sorry, parts to them. That's actually coming down to the next point. So in the CAD, you can uh, do a bomb generation. So that's what they need to provide the coach is a list of parts they need. Coach will, oh, well, it's too much work on coach. The coach or maybe the build lead will sort out the parts to them. So they take the parts, go home to build it, um, to separate the work to, uh, from each other. So that's uh, a point here. Um, in the afternoon, my team member, uh, my Catalyst presentation will demonstrate how you generate a bomb in uh, Fusion 360 automatically. And the last path uh, is a simulator for autonomous path planning and tuning. So then uh, the programmer can do the work without robot be ready. So my team happened to find this uh, simulator written by gluten free. So this is the top team there. Uh, it may not be apply applicable to everyone. I think that one requires uh, locate localization, the robot. You have to know the robot um, X and Y and heading feed into it. So it will simulate stuff. So but it's something uh, it's worth to take a look. Um, Anthony will do some demo of this one during his talk this afternoon in advanced track. So those are the few points I have in mind. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing, Coach Fong. So now we're going to start the um, panel's discussion. So you guys in the audience can send in some questions you want to ask the panelists in the chat or with the Q&A box, and uh, any of the panelists can answer them. Or well, raise hands also fine, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and we'll unmute you and you can ask yeah. that. Okay, we have one from uh, Cynthia Tomotaki. Are any of your teams school-based teams? Okay, uh, I believe our team 8565 is actually not school-based, we're a community team, um, but anyone else, you guys can answer that question. Yeah, I guess the others, yeah, all of three of us, all community team, then plus the virtual school team. Okay, we have one in the Q&A. During this COVID situation, how does your team do outreach or fundraising? Um, any of the panelists want to answer that? Uh, okay, I can answer that. So my team did fundraising. Um, in the past, my team has done the fundraising through <clears throat> teaching a summer camp, EV3 summer camp. So uh, this season, we actually planned, we planned to do a FTC crash course at the very beginning, I thought we cannot do it. And uh, during the summer, we actually tried. To, we adjust our content to put more emphasis on the CAD. So actually, we delivered that. Um, <clears throat> so we asked, we design, for example, we're using Minibot from uh, uh, Rev. And then use that as an example, have the teach, taught the, them about the CAD skills. Then they make the model in the CAD. Uh, for programming, it's a little bit hard, um, but there's a, there are some, some campers, they actually starting the camp, sorry, starting the team. So they do have some robot, the others, we give, we kind of ask them to set up uh, uh, an Android phone. So that at least I can access, download the app. At least they can have access to blocks programming or Unbound Java UI. They can follow, a, instruction to write code, just cannot download, uh, run it. The instructor will show the code and download and show the behavior. So it's not the best, but um, it de definitely helped the team. So that's our fundraising uh, from uh, um, outreach. So one thing we did this summer was uh, introducing this robotics fun hour, a uh, um, virtual one. So every Friday night for an hour, we talk about different things in robotics and uh, there's a CAD topics, builder topics, and we have this global code 
virtual competition. So those are all good for virtual uh, activities. And uh, for the in the season, we probably provide more uh, virtual help through Zoom to the teams who need help. And to like the Boys and Girls Club, we're helping uh, working with them in the past few years. We will continue in, in the Zoom mode. So we have to utilize a lot of Zoom this season. Okay, uh, here is another one. How do you keep everyone on your team busy and contributing meaningfully? So I can take that one. Okay. Or at least describe what we do on 7172. And I, I mean, you know, this is kind of weird. Again, we're not, we're a community team. We're not a school team, but in some sense we don't. Um, we, uh, we, we have a, such a wide variety of team members who have different levels of activities. And so we don't try to do meetings where we make sure that everybody attends. It's, you know, when we have a meeting, we basically say we're meeting uh, these times during the week. It's usually like Sunday afternoons and then once, one or two evenings a week. And we just know in advance that some people won't make it. And so as long as we have three or more people that are uh, able to attend, then we say, okay, well, we're going to meet. And we'll be able to get something meaningful done. Um, we have always made use of, and we will certainly be making heavy use of um, an instant messaging platform. We use Discord instead of Slack, uh, but, uh, uh, and our meetings will take place over Slack now since we are not able to gather and meet in person. So we'll meet over Slack. Uh, but uh, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our meetings, a lot of our work takes place not even during the official meeting times, but outside of the meetings. When, when we have a meeting, it's kind of a checkpoint for everybody to make sure that they're all working together and that they all know what the plan is and then people go off and work individually. Um, occasionally we have gotten a, you know, a couple of team members that maybe weren't pulling their weight or weren't necessarily able to attend as many meetings as we'd like. Um, and uh, in a couple of extreme cases, we've actually just asked them, hey, you're not really you know, contributing, so you just, you know, we're sorry, but we would need you to leave the team. Um, in other cases, we'll tell them, you know, please just, you know, contribute online, contribute to the notebook, do something uh, to please, you know, be a part of, of what's happening. But, um, you know, we try not to, we try not to say that the meetings are the three hours of the week where everybody's participating. For us, the three, the meetings are the three hours of the week where, um, or the times of the week where we'll be getting together and planning and things like that. And then people go off and continue working. Yeah, and that's a very that's a very good point from uh, Coach Patrick. But uh, I'll add a little bit my perspective here. So for my team, as we're a rookie team, they got so much to learn. So it's really easy to keep them busy. And the, plus our mentoring team, Coach Fon's team, they always remind me. So this is uh, probably what a rookie team is suitable for learn. So we break every aspects of the robot into sub and mini projects for them. Actually, you can see in the afternoon's beginners track some of my team members that's what they're presenting is the many projects we assign to them. There should be deliverables, there should be outputs, and there should be presentable of outputs there, like the PID control in Java, automation in TeleOP or TensorFlow. Those kind of the study items and many projects are, I think those are really good for them, uh, for coaches to plan for them and to keep them busy. Oh, that's my take here. I just want to add one thing, I mean, come to Patrick's talking. So the team meeting is really a checkpoint. It's not working, work is all done offline. Um, so we are just like a product manager to make sure everything's on, on the milestone and dependencies. That's what happened in the team meeting. Okay, thank you for your insight. Okay, now, how are you all planning to do build after CAD and design? Some schools are not under, allowing their students to enter the campus. Well, since none of us really are school teams, I'm not sure how to answer that. But I guess in this sense, it's the same. They do not enter campuses. Um, okay, it depends on us. So for, for me, my team, the whole summer, I do have one or two team members coming to work on the robots, but we never hold any um, physical meeting together since uh, February. Um, I guess it's probably have to meet with a coach once. Coach, but the coach, yeah, I know, coach would be lots of risk. <laughs> you are going to touch with all the 
team members. Uh, the plan to do build, um, I guess it all depends on the CAD. So my team last season, we had, uh, we already do a similar thing. Uh, my, my, our robot was divided into five subsystems. I have five builders working on the five subsystems. They all build themselves and in the end, we have to put them together. So this put together step is going to be harder this season. I can see it's probably go slower. I cannot get all five together, maybe two at a time or something. So that's probably the plan for this season. For 7172, like other teams, we haven't physically met in the same place since March. Um, and so we've all just been meeting online. Our expectation for build is that most of the, most of the building has traditionally taken place uh, here at my house. And so we'll probably have one or two team members that will come to the house here to do the building. And our plan is to set up webcams on them. Uh, they'll have a head mounted webcam and we'll have a, a room mounted webcam and we'll conduct a, a Discord meeting or a Zoom meeting and where everybody can participate. And the, the people who are physically present will be the remote eyes and ears uh, putting the parts together based on directions from others and based on uh, whatever else is happening. We're gonna try that and see if it works. Um, we've also in the past done the p bits where we'd send parts uh, to a particular team member and they build it individually and then bring it back. And for that, you know, they can just pick things up from my doorstep and leave them on my doorstep and we don't have to have any direct contact that way. So uh, it, that's a challenge every team is going to have this year. It's just going to be, you know, if you can't get you know, people together, how are you physically, physically going to build a robot? And that's partially why, um, w one of the reasons why uh, I've chosen as, as affiliate partner, taking off my coach hat for a moment, uh, why I'm pushing events later so that teams have more opportunities and we have more time to figure out how you're actually gonna build the robot uh, before you're having to go to a competition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now we have a lot of questions about the simulator for autonomous. Uh, first, will you be discussing the simulator in more detail later? Uh, yes, it's going to be in the afternoon. If you see, uh, did, we, Melody, did we send the detailed schedule to everyone? Or you can go to Flyset. I did post the detailed schedule for individual sessions. So in the afternoon, we have a session called the autonomous, sorry, Q Pursuit. For with uh, autonomous, so that session from, by Anthony, he's going to talk about that uh, uh, simulator and the demo of that simulator. Okay, yeah, and another one: Have we had success with synthesis or other simulators for simulating physics and virtual driver practice? For seventy-one seventy-two, the answer is no. We have not. Yeah, yeah, the simulator I mentioned, they comes with some called a uh, physics simulator. So I guess you can go to the session and talk to Anthony because um, I didn't get much details from him. He's working on that the whole summer. So get more from Anthony on that one. He did mention to me it has a physics simulation there. Okay, and could you please provide information on what simulators are available to simulate the path of the robot? Okay, the one I mentioned is the only one I know as of, as of now. I don't know if anyone else knows about any other simulator. Uh, we've never done, 7172 has never done much investigation in the simulators um, because what limited bits that we've done, we found that uh, uh, the simulators don't match what our robot does anyway. Or maybe we should say our robot doesn't match what the simulator does. And so, uh, it hasn't it hasn't given us a lot of information that we thought made it worth the time to invest in the simulator. We've just you know, been working on the robot. Um, there may be, there, I, I know there are some other teams that have had success with simulation, but we're not one of them. So Anthony tried this summer, he somehow can match the field behavior to the simulator, but we have to do more investigation. Is that one time luck or <laughs> it's always consistent? Okay, uh, next, has remote matches and scrimmages been tried out? How does remote generally work? We don't know. 
Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it's sad, but the details still haven't been released. And, and I think that the, the, the truth is, is that they're still working out some of those details. There's a lot of technical details that have to take place and so forth. Uh, remote judging is uh, going to try to be very similar to what in-person judging was what had been, except that we'll do it through Zoom conferences or some other conferencing tool. Uh, we're still working out those details and, and the first in Texas staff uh, in both First Tech Challenge and First Lego League met last week to kind of map that out and plan it out. And uh, we still don't know all of the details, but you can expect that you will have uh, some sort of a, a time where uh, your team, and it'll be a, it won't be like assigned to you to say you have to be at this time. We'll probably have sign up slots or something like that, where there'll be time slots where teams will gather for um, a meeting with their judging panel and uh, um, do, do a presentation of sorts like we've done in the past, maximum of five minutes, um, allow the judges to ask and answer questions of the team and for the team to kind of explain what their, um, what their journey had been in the season, much like we did in the past. So it will just take place over a Zoom conference as opposed to being in person. Uh, we do know that judging will be challenging because uh, the judges can't physically see your robot. So some things that 7172 is likely to do is we'll have some pre-made videos of our robot doing different activities that we can use as part of our presentation and switch into our presentation. Um, I know we're being told by first that it won't be, uh, you can't just do a canned five minute presentation, parts of the presentation or parts of the, uh, the initial part where you're giving things to judges do have to be live. You can't just pre-record your entire presentation, uh, but you can certainly have pre-recorded video clips or things like that that you would wanna share in the presentation. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I don't see any more questions right now. Um, maybe uh, I, I can ask the coach Jared, because I heard your team like across the Texas, you, you, you had your programmers in Austin while your builders in Dallas. So how did you handle um, last year on this? Oh, I think he said he had to step away for a moment. Oh, oh. I'm not sure how long we'll be gone. Okay, now when he's back, then we can come to this. Okay. Uh, I have a further question to Patrick. So there's a penalty change and the ranking change. It sounds like it's a fit, there's a remote event. Is that, do you think it's a permanent change or it's kind of a change for this year? I suspect it's a change for this year. I suspect okay. it's not permanent. Um, uh, Yes, I, I suspect it's not permanent. I suspect it's this year because they need to have some some consistency between the traditional and the remote events, and so um, they couldn't they couldn't they didn't feel comfortable with doing the win loss tie ranking system, and saying you know if you're in that system then penalties act one way but it, they act a different way, and so I think they just said this year it's just going to be you know all based on scoring, um, for you know and for some teams that ends up being really good. Because that way, you know, um, you, you know, if if you, <laughs> it, it used to be as as many uh, veteran teams will tell you, right? If you're in a match and you scored 500 points, which is like one of the highest scores, and the other side scored 501, you still lost, right? And you 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 got some credit for your 500 score, and it helped in some ways, but you know, it it you you could end up with a really bad schedule where. Um, you, you know, where you literally had like the highest scoring robot at the event, but you lost like three or four of your matches because you just happened to be up against a bad alliance or something like that. This kind of gets rid of some of that. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if your robot can score really well, you're going to rank highly. Um, it, it, does, uh, it does remove some of the... Um, some of the, it's likely to remove some of the interaction. Like, you know, the, like at the end of a match, they could say like red wins, but that doesn't actually mean anything in terms of rankings. Uh, all that matters is how many points you got. Uh, so I, I, but I do think it's a one year thing. I, um, that's my guess. Uh, I think first as a whole would like to get back to the competitive, competitive alliance versus alliance sort of, uh, sort of a competition structure. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we've got a few more questions. Um, 
Will all the competition recordings be available this year? I hope so. Um, you know, it depends on technology uh, and what we're able to achieve. Um, again, my plan is that for all competitions that we will live stream them. Um, we will certainly record them in some way, and then we will try to post them on YouTube. Uh, that can be more challenging than it sounds at times. Like if you're doing a recording in an event and there's background music playing, then you can have it not be postable on YouTube because of copyright infringements. So, you know, you have to take into account lots of different things. But yes, we're, the, the hope is, is that uh, all of the uh, competitions uh, will be uh, uh, live streamed where we can and recorded and, and playable back. Um, where we can, we, we, we're, we're gathering the equipment to make that happen. So what about, it? are you able to choose a remote and then the other one be uh, in person if you go to multiple? Uh, yes, um, so if we, uh, if we do remotes, um, and, and I suspect that we will, then those teams that cannot travel to an event because they're restricted from doing so will have priority for those remote events, right? So um, just because the other ones that can travel. Uh, one thing that um, I didn't cover in the earlier uh, part, but kind of is useful for coaches to know is other people have asked me how many events will we run? Because we don't even know how many teams are gonna be in the region this year. Right now our team numbers are down. Uh, because a lot of people are deciding not to compete this year. And so um, what my choice has been and what I've been saying, I, and that, that's expected for all FIRST programs. For all FIRST programs, they're expecting, you know, you may experience like a 20% or 30% or even more drop in teams this year, uh, just as teams decide that they won't be able to compete. Um, I'm planning to, to the extent that we can, run the same number of events. Uh, those events may have fewer teams. If you know in past seasons, a lot of our events would have 28, 30, or even more teams at the event. And that's what makes for a long day. So rather than try and cut down the number of events, I want to try and keep the number of events the same. And we just run it with fewer teams. So we may have more events that have like s smaller number of teams, which makes it easier to run. Um, so uh, that also by having more events scheduled, if something happens and an event has to cancel, like if a traditional event has to cancel because the venue, you know, the school says, nope, we're closing the school, then we have more opportunities for teams to be able to find another event to be able to get into. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's no real difference between a traditional and a remote event in the sense that you get a certain number of events and you can choose to do two traditionals if you're able to make that work or a traditional and a remote or two remotes. Um, again, the caveat being that, um, that those teams that can't do traditional get preference for the remotes. And if those get full, then, you know, then we won't have other teams in it. I think that answered the question. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Um, do you think remote matches will be more advantageous than in-person matches? No, <laughs> I don't. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, I can't say why exactly, um, but uh, um, if you're thinking that, you know, with the remote match, you'll be able to spend several days to get really high scores, right? That may be true, but that would be true for everybody. And I'm, I don't expect that to be true. What I, what I believe is likely to happen is that you'll basically, however you're doing your remote matches, you'll start and there'll be a time limit to complete all of your, your set matches. And so you won't have like days and days and days or, or even necessarily to be able to run matches out of order. So um, I don't think there'll be a lot of advantage to remote matches over traditional. In fact, it, it, it's, I think it's gonna be pretty even. Okay, uh, it looks like um, the participants can't rename themselves. Oh, I just realized this webinar, they do not yeah. do this. Sorry. Um, okay. I believe uh, 
we have another 15 minutes. Uh, sure, we can maybe look up the person in the registration to find a number there. Let's con we can continue here while Shop is doing that. Sorry, Shop will give you more work. Yeah, okay. Uh, from Justine Thomas, are the field pieces easy to DIY this year? I can't tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not able to say that, say anything about it. Uh, at least I don't think I am. Let me think about it for a second. Um, what I what I can say what I can say is that uh, because of the restrictions, there's been a lot of thought about how you can make it possible for a lot of teams to get fields, right? Because if you can't hold an event in a single place, then you've got to be able to hold it in lots of places, possibly like one at a time or something like that. And so fields need to be readily available. And so um, there, there almost certainly ought to be some do-it-yourself options. And, uh, and we at First in Texas, um, like um, First in Texas often ends up with end of year funding. And this last year they asked me, you know, how many fields do you want? Um, how many field kits, uh, field element sets do you want? And normally I would say, give me four, because that's what we need for the region. And this year I said, please give me at least six. Um, so that we'll have extras just because I don't know how easy it will be to move things around. So uh, just know that people are working on that. All right, uh, Coach Fong, I think Coach Clark is back now. So you can ask uh, him the question that you were going to ask. Him. Oh, okay, Coach Clark, um, my earlier question was, uh, I think I heard that you have a programmers in Austin and builders in Dallas. So how do you make that work last season? Uh, it's a bit of a struggle. Um, it was through coordinating. Uh, I would designate a day to meet and have uh, everybody come up that was in the area. And then if they were programmers, just work online and screen share and then test the coding to see if it would work out. It's a lot of trial and error, but um, it really works through using our uh, screen sharing apps and the Google Docs, like I was referring to earlier, to uh, make it all very fluid as far as communication and sharing of all data. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Coach Clark. Uh, we have another question. Um, our favorite part of every event is the award ceremony. How will this happen with the present circumstances? We will have an award ceremony. Um, when the, we will uh, almost certainly live stream broadcast award ceremonies for every event. Um, just almost like what we had done before. Um, we'll, you know, have uh, uh, the announcements um, that will take place. Uh, we'll be able to announce scores. We'll be able to announce, um, you know, uh, matches. Hopefully we'll be able to show some videos of some of the things that had happened um, and we'll announce awards. So I, um, you know, lots of, lots of folks are looking at ways to do that. Um, First is developing some, some tools to help the individual event sites be able to stage a good online award ceremony. So um, for the remote events, I, we will definitely have an award ceremony of some sort and I'm sure we'll get better at it as, um, as uh, folks go on. And we'll also be experimenting with that with the scrimmages, right? So that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about doing remote scrimmages is so that all of us can find out what the remote system will actually look like and we can um, build some of those tools and some of those processes so that when we get to the real events, uh, we know better ways to do award ceremonies and things like that. Yeah, I agree. The award ceremony is a big part for me. I, I like doing the award ceremony. Okay, thank you, Dr. Patrick. Uh, we don't have any other, oh, there's one. Uh, are we going to be able to see all the other team's scores for the region? Uh, yeah, well, certainly they'll be posted after the fact. They'll be posted on like the Orange Alliance, right? So if you go to the Orange Alliance, that's the central website that collects all of the scores. So you would be able to see all of the scores there. 
um, on the Orange Alliance. And because we'll be live streaming events, we'll be live report, like if live streaming traditional events, uh, those scores will be real time posted to the Orange Alliance as well. So the Orange Alliance is almost certainly going to be the place where you can see scores. You probably can't see scores for an event until, for a remote event until everybody has finished turning in their scores because that wouldn't be fair, right? So if somebody turned in their scores on like Wednesday, then everybody knows that they would, you know, what they need to do to beat those scores. And so I suspect there may be some sort of an embargo on scores um, until the, the day of the event and until people have gotten most of their scores in. Okay, and will events be exclusively remote or exclusively in person or a blend of both at the same event? Uh, an event is designated as either remote or traditional. Um, and there's not a blend because the rankings are different for the two types of events. So um, there is, there is a, 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 a spectrum of ways that events can be run, but a traditional event means that uh, all of the robots have to appear um, on the same fields and the same venue uh, in order to be able to do their matches because they're done with alliances. So you can't have some teams competing remotely and some teams competing uh, otherwise. You could do judging remotely at a traditional event. Uh, but um, if it's a traditional event, then it's the standard, um, you know, all the robots are gathered in one place over a relatively short period of time to conduct their, their matches. If it's a remote event, uh, part of the spectrum is we could have a place where a lot of teams gather but stay socially distanced, right? Or we could have places where we say, like, go to this site for um, an hour or so and we will run through your five matches with you and you don't have to have your own field or anything like that, but you can bring your robot. We'll be able to record the matches for you, walk you through all of the things like that. And we'll probably have multiple fields set up at that site. So teams can come in, but not have to interact with each other. Um, and so that's not, you know, that's not remote of nobody sees each other or nobody's in the same place, but um, it's certainly that way. So we'll, we'll see that, but there won't be a, a hybrid event there could be a hybrid season. So the season could have some events that are traditional and some that are remote, but there won't be any events that are partly traditional and partly remote as far as the competition structure goes. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any new questions uh, right now. So oh, there's one. How does that work for the North Texas Championship? It works the same way. Uh, man, you know, Put the North Texas Championship in March and let's hope that things are clear enough that we can actually meet in person. Um, if we can't and we absolutely can't meet in person, then the North Texas Championship, uh, then we won't be the only ones in that boat. There'll be a lot of others, uh, certainly throughout the state of Texas, and it will be an entirely remote event. Um, so I, I'm really, really hoping it doesn't come to that. I'm really hoping that that uh, we're able to get a handle on uh, the health situation so that we're able to do things. Other countries have done it in less time than there is between now and the North Texas Championship. So if other countries have, have done it, then there's the entire possibility that the Republic of Texas can do it too. So uh, if, uh, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really hopeful and that's part of the reason why I've declared up front that our championship will be in mid-March. Okay, now I'm not seeing any new questions. Um, so, yeah, okay, my question, if it's a championship, how, what's the ranking? So if, if no playoff, it's all by the ranking. It's all by rankings and it would be by, I don't know how you would decide the divisions. <laughs> I don't know how you would do the divisions. I'm sure they'll figure it out between now and then, right? But it would be by rankings, right? Uh, so um, the order of advancement for the uh, regional championship, this is a guess, right? Inspire Award winner one, um, top ranked team in one division, uh, top, uh, Inspire two, top ranked team in the other division. Um, and, oh no, actually it's all scores at that case. So you don't have to worry about divisions. Mm -hmm. All together in one. It's all together. So you totally, yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about divisions at all. 
So, so if it's a remote championship, there are no divisions. It's 48 teams and the top scoring teams are slotted into the spots where the winning alliance and finalist alliance would normally go. So you basically go with all the ranking that adding all the awards in between. Right. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Earlier you mentioned that if it's a reduced e event in person, so you only allow drive team, how do you define drive team? Because we need program support also. Uh, and, and that's fine, right? What, what, the, the point is, is that we'll be asking teams like, please limit it to the bare minimum mm -hmm. that you need at this event to be able to run your robot, right? Don't, you don't, you know, please don't, uh, it, please, don't or try not to bring parents as spectators, right? We don't want lots of people sitting in the stands. Um, please don't, you know, bring people who need to be there for judging because we're going to do judging online and, we'll, and the judging would take place on different days than when the matches take place if we did something like that, um, you know, or, or work it out. But the, the point is, is that, you know, if let's say that we have a restriction where um, you're not allowed to have more than 150 people gather in a spot, right? You're not allowed to have an event with more than 150 people. Well, if we tell all the teams bring everybody, we just can't do a traditional event. Maybe we can't anyway. But if every team is able to say, well, we're only going to bring four or five people, then we can do it. So it, 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 I, we probably wouldn't be super strict in terms of, you know, what needs to happen. But if a team says, no, I need to bring all 15 of my team members, then it's like, well, okay, you know, that's probably not the appropriate one for you. Um, and we'll know more in October or November. But that's, that's, what, that's what we're thinking about when we think of reduced things is, you know, drive team enough to help you out in the pits. And that would include programmers. Um, there are no further questions or discussions. Uh, Shobu, if you're ready for the drawing, we can go ahead and get that started since it's almost 1230. I'm ready. Uh, we, we were able to identify most people as long as your name matching your registration <laughs> name. Uh, there's a few don't have a full spelled out name, so we cannot match. Otherwise, you should have been in the list. Okay. So I will guess I'll start the drawing. Okay. So the drawing is going to be $50 credit at gobuilda.com and we're going to start now. The winner is team 15524. Please uh, chat with us in Zoom to all panelists. DM us your email, phone number, your team name, and team number. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, come to the morning session. So in the afternoon, we also have a drawing. So it's better uh, you come in with your actual name and actually also putting your team number. We should have done this earlier, sending an email to tell everyone when sign in to have a team number after that. 